Well, we finished last time with the abolition of the chantries in 1547. There are additional things, though, especially put on the Roman Catholics. They were barred from inheriting land, entering the professions, or taking up a civil or military post. Uh, they also had to be buried in the Church of England churches, and because uh, they had to have them registered there. Although a lot of these sort of Catholic uh, families in the north uh, had access to private chapels, especially in the larger houses where services continued to be held, is that, and they may well have been baptised and uh, married in there, but obviously not buried. Uh, is that uh, they still had to resort to the local Church of England in order to legally register their birth and marriages and obviously the deaths had to take place in that churchyard as well. Around this time everybody had to pay the church rate uh, or as it's known today the parochial fee. This fee was meant to be used to, make, uh, to meet the costs of the divine service. Uh, also some of it was meant to repair the fabric of a church and to pay the salaries of those officiating there as well. Times came a little bit more settled uh, when Elizabeth I came onto the throne, and it seems though that uh, those people who would have fairly uh, standard tombs, as we see on this picture, felt emboldened enough to actually go for more elaborate tombs. This is the uh, tomb of Sir Marmaduke Wyville uh, in uh, the parish church of St Mary at Massam. Uh, he died uh, aged 76 in 1617. So, uh, but the actual tomb predates that because his wife predeceased, predeceased him and died in 1613. Can't quite see on this photograph, but just below his wife uh, are memorials to their uh, 12 children, eight of which actually survived into adulthood, which is quite um, uh, unusual for this time. The plaque behind uh, Sir Marmaduke is in Latin, uh, but basically it says uh, that it gives a history of the lineage of the family. They were um, descended from Lord Scroop of Massam. And because uh, they maybe they were a bit emboldened this time, because although the family took part in 1569 in the rising of the North, uh, they were pardoned by Queen Elizabeth. So Marmaduke here became MP for Richmond in 1585 and again 1597 to 98 and created a baronet by uh, James I on the 1st of January 1611. You probably had to pay quite dearly for that in, money, in financial terms. Because it came a lot more settled when Je, uh, Je, um, Charles II came onto the throne in 1660. Before that, we'd had the interregnum uh, with the sort of uh, Puritans under Oliver Cromwell, who won the uh, Civil War in sort of 1645. Unusually, Yorkshire has a link with Oliver Cromwell, and it's up at Newborough Hall at Coxwold, and it's where the body of Oliver Cromwell is buried. He died on the Friday the 3rd of September 1658, aged 59, thought to be of a kidney or a urinary infection, and was buried with honours at Westminster Abbey. But with the restoration of Charles II in 1660, his body was disinterred from there on the 30th of January 1661 and hung in chains at the Tyburn and was then thrown into a pit not before his uh, head had been decapitated and was displayed on a pole outside Westminster Hall until 1685. The body uh, was claimed uh, by his daughter, Elizabeth Claypole, and it's her who lived up at Newborough Priory, but in fact she actually predeceased Oliver Cromwell. Uh, she died in August 1658, a week or so just before her father did. But his uh, body was brought up to Newborough Priory and is interred in the attic. So that's what this sort of brick vault is here. The head on top of that is a death mask of Oliver Cromwell. I believe that there's another one in, on display in York Castle Museum as well. People don't really know whether the body of uh, Cromwell is in there because that tomb has never been opened. But if you go on a tour of Newborough Priory, they do take you up into the attic uh, to show you the tomb. We don't like you to take photographs, so I sneakily took this one whilst the guide was in the other room of the attic up there. Things started to change, especially with the coming of the Religious Toleration Act of 1668. Uh, and really, this was to stop the Catholic succession that could have been possible uh, at this time. And they invited over William of Orange and his wife, Queen Mary II. 
And uh, in order to sort of get that support is that uh, they allowed freedom of worship to non-conformists, uh, Baptists, congregation congregationalists, Quakers and English Presbyterians, but not for Roman Catholics or those of a non-Christian faith. And because those of a non-Christian faith also had to accept oaths of allegiance to the crown. So they still continued to be excluded from political offices and also from universities as well. And it's also stipulated that no services could take place in the home, but only at licen licensed meeting houses and chapels. And so um, that reached a royal assent on the 24th of May 1689. Some of the best tombs from this time can be seen in uh, Knaresborough Parish Church, and that's where we're going to have a look at them now. We've now moved to the north side of the church, to the chapel of the ancient Slingsby family. Here is Francis Slingsby, who died in 1600, aged 78. On his right, unusually, because she was of a higher social status, his wife Mary, who was the daughter of Sir Thomas Percy. Now just think, this man was a cavalry officer under Henry VIII, Mary Tudor and Queen Elizabeth. A remarkable family. Their eldest son is Sir Henry Slingsby, MP for Knaresborough, High Sheriff of Yorkshire, but that didn't prevent him from spending two years in prison for mishandling the funds of the Duchy of Lancaster. And here we see him in his shroud, rising from the dead on the Day of Judgment. This handsome effigy is over the tomb of Sir Henry's brother, Sir William Slingsby, also MP for Knaresborough, and Commissary of the Fleet under Queen Elizabeth and knighted by James I in 1603. In contrast to the more elaborate tombs, we have this plain slab of black marble brought here from St Robert's Priory to honour Sir Harry Slingsby. Sir Harry was a royalist who had fought on the losing side at Marston Moor and it says here at the bottom that he was executed by the tyrant Cromwell. He had been arraigned on a charge of high treason but Cromwell impressed by Sir Harry as a gentleman commuted the sentence which would have of course been hanging, drawing and quartering for a traitor to the comparatively respectable one of beheading. He was beheaded on Tower Hill and the headless body was brought back here to Knaresborough and when this tomb was opened a few years ago it was found that the skeleton was indeed without a head. The saddest tomb of all is the tomb of Sir Charles Slingsby who on the 4th of February 1869 was hunting with the York and Ainsty hounds, a fox hunt near Newby Hall. And they were crossing the River Ure in a barge that big enough to hold both horses and men. But the horses became restless, the barge capsized, and on that day, eight horses and six men were drowned including Sir Charles Slingsby, the last of the line. Ten years later, in 1678, came the burying in Wool Act, and uh, that required the dead, except the plague victims and the destitute and poor, to be buried in English woolen shrouds. Up to then, roughly starting when the French Normans came in in 1066, is that bodies were wrapped in linen shrouds. Uh, but there's this uh, bit of contrapunce between 
England and France, and uh, it was banned from importing uh, linen from France to wrap them in, in, in shrouds. It's thought that in the year before this, or the decade before this, is that 23 million yards of linen had been imported at a cost of 25 million pounds. So this, in a way, was to spur on uh, the English woolen industry uh, and exclude the imports in, into the country. And if you look in a parish register, it might have the word affidavit after a burial. And that would mean to say that it has been concluded or been conclusively proven is that the body has been, shrapped in, uh, has been wrapped in a woolen shroud. Something else that was introduced around this time was the hanging of maidens' garlands in churches. Uh, the first and oldest, or the oldest surviving uh, garland is on display in St Mary's Church in Beverley, and that dates from 1680. But the biggest collection in Yorkshire, and there's about 14 of these, are uh, hung in Old St Stephen's Church at Robin Hood's Bay. This was built in Georgian times, and so they all date uh, from that period. And it's thought that, um, that uh, bits of ribbon and other material uh, from the young lady that was deceased uh, was woven into uh, on, on a circle. I guess it was a bit like a, a headdress type of thing. And that uh, other bits of fabric from her friends uh, were placed in this as well, carried it in front or probably on top of the coffin into the church and then left in the church after it. Uh, a bit like the um, the uh, whole birds that we'd seen earlier on in the uh, in the first part of this uh, program, and these are hung at the back of some uh, at the old St Stephen's Church in Robin Hood's Bay in a display cabinet. The most recent one is uh, dates from 1955, and probably uh, dates from the oldest virgin uh, to which there is a uh, a, a garland. Uh, she died age 90. Uh, a lady called Ella Menel. So let's look, uh, move on to sort of a, uh, another old person who's certainly much older than Eleanor was, and that's a chap called Henry Jenkins. Uh, he's uh, buried in, in the churchyard of St Mary at Bolton on Swale in, in North Yorkshire. He claimed to have been born in 1501 and uh, born in the village just a mile south of uh, Bolton on Swale at Ellerton on Swale. He's said to have been a butler to Lord Conyers at Hornby Castle, which is near Craig Hall, and later in life earned his living from being a, a fisherman. He swore on oath in 1667 that he was aged 157 or thereabouts, and he remembered carrying arch, uh, arrows to the archers at the Battle of Flotton Field in 1513. He died in, on the 6th of December 1670 and was buried in the churchyard here. Uh, there's a very worn inscription on the tomb, uh, but it has been rewritten and hung on the inside of the church, and it says, Blush not, marble, to rescue from oblivion the memory of Henry Jenkins, a person obscure in birth, but of a life truly memorable. For he was enriched with the goods of nature, if not of fortune, and happy in the duration, if not the variety of his enjoyments. And though the partial world despised and disregarded his low and humble state, the equal eye of providence beheld and blessed it with a patriarch's health and length of days. To teach mistaken men where blessings are entailed on temperance, a life of labour and a mind of ease. He lived to the amazing age of 169, was interred here, was interred here December the 6th, 1670, and had this justice done to his memory, 1743. That means that the plaque was installed in 1743. So perhaps the most unusual tomb can be found at St Mary, another St Mary actually, at South Dalton, uh, which is high up on the Wolds. It's a Victorian church today and well known for its enormously high spire that can be seen from most of the Wolds. Uh, the old church was uh, stood in the uh, grounds of that and was demolished and the tombs of the Hovham family, who still live there in the hall, the uh, village is well known for its gastronomy uh, because the pipe and glass uh, restaurant is, is based there, uh, which holds a Michelin star. But if you go inside, you can see in this side chapel, uh, the tomb of St John Hovham, the second baronet who died in 1689. 
He's there reclining on top of his tomb, uh, held in place by uh, four statues representing the cardinal virtues. But look underneath, and there he is after his life on this mortal earth, uh, back uh, just to uh, skin and bone, as he would have been found in his coffin. It's a rather unusual one. I mentioned this uh, um, a minute ago, Hatchments, uh, but in fact, I uh, thought it was in uh, the first programme, but it was in, in this one. And this is another St Mary's Church, and this time it's at Thirsk. Uh, hatchments are a corruption of the word attachment and became popular in the 17th century. When someone died, their coat of arms was hung above their door into the property and were normally usually kept there for six to 12 months, uh, I guess, a, a period of mourning. But quite soon after that, um, someone must have decided is that they're going to carry these hatchments in front of a coffin uh, on the way into the church and that they will be left there afterwards. And you can see here, the ones in St Mary's at, at first uh, are largely to the Bell family. So if you look at this one here, you can see the three bells on that as well. So perhaps the best place uh, to go to, to look at uh, uh, a churchyard is probably Hepton Store, a mile straight above Hebden Bridge on the Calder Valley. The churchyard here is packed with graves. It's said that there's over 100,000 burials in here. And I guess it was seen as being uh, a part of a, a temporary measure if you're buried in the churchyard here, uh, because obviously there aren't 100,000 uh, graves, but the graves were continuously reused. Is that, in fact, is that the gravestones here uh, were lifted and turned over and reinscribed on the other side when they ran out of space along here. And when they sort of did that is that the bones that they found underneath the grave slab were interred in this building here. This is called a charnel house. Uh, and I guess they were hopefully uh, tied up in, uh, in uh, what they thought were the bones of the same person. And I guess it sort of came out of practice and all those bones were thrown away. And the charnel house was then uh, came part of the house uh, in which lies behind it. But it's rather unusual up in uh, the Calder Valley. They tend to have their own sort of style of graves up here. Look on this one here, uh, and we see here for this is for William Hartley here. A lot of them have a heart on them, and they're a bit more ornate with these sort of the lettering on them uh, and the dates round here and other scrolls and other things like that. This one, as you can see here, dates from uh, 1734 when it's written in that. It comes further down there. The date above that is 1709. They're roughly found with this sort of heart uh, de design on them in around about a 20 mile, 25 mile radius of the sort of the Halifax area. Indeed, there's one here in the uh, Horsef on the green, and that one's dated 1670. And uh, but this one we see here is to uh, a chap just named higher, higher up on here, David Hartley. He lived on Crag Vale. He was a bit of a naughty man. He clipped gold coins. That's taking the edge off them, devaluing them by around about 15 percent. Probably not enough for someone who doesn't regularly uh, happen to handle them to know that it is slightly lighter than it should be. But when they started to circulate uh, in, in great quantities in Halifax Marketplace, the Customs and Excise Inspector, uh, William Deaton, was sent up to find out where this was happening. And he was pointed up to Crag Vale, but on approaching the farmhouse up there in quite a remote uh, area, he was attacked and killed. Police were then sent further up to find out what had gone on and arrested the people uh, around there, but not uh, with David Hartley. Uh, but on torture, the people gave up the names of David Hartley. He was arrested there, sent to Halifax, uh, but because there'd been a murder involved and it was a capital offence to clip coins, uh, he was sent from the uh, magistrate's court in Halifax up to the Assize Court, the most important one in Yorkshire, at uh, York. Uh, and this is where a lot of uh, people came in for the season at York to watch these trials and then attend the hangings afterwards. He was hung in York on the 28th of April 1770, but his body was brought back and buried here. And because they round about this time we're talking about in 1783, the Stamp Act uh, was introduced, uh, which required 
every burial uh, that uh, was registered in the church book for three pence uh, to be paid. Not only covered burials, but it also covered uh, the, bur uh, the marriages uh, and christenings as well, as well as the registering uh, the birth. And because uh, this was really to shore up the sort of the coffers of, of, of Parliament and that the vicar there would get 10% of that value uh, for doing that. Uh, and like I say, it, then the following year uh, went to cover non-conformists as well. So it was really all about money. But let's return to the sort of stories of uh, David Hartley and his execution up at York. As I mentioned, they all took place up here uh, as well. Uh, the first one taking place in York on the Naysmar on the 31st of March 1379, when Edward Hewison was executed for rape on what was called the New Gallows at the York Tyburn. Executions took place here and at three other sites in York for the next 400 years. Execution Day were big, rowdy events uh, and really became a spectacle uh, that brought in people from miles around to come and watch these. So it was more like fairs and handbills were printed. Uh, I presume a lot of beer was drunk. The, um, the last uh, night of the uh, person to be hung uh, was held, uh, they were held in York Castle. Invariably, they were put on a hurdle and dragged behind a horse down to the place of execution, where they put onto the gallows and then hung from there. Quite often they were sold to be uh, had their bodies quartered as well after hanging, but I think that took place in the castle. That took place, uh, I guess they were hanging and quartering of bodies until 1745. The last hanging, public hanging, took place in York in 1801. That was in order, as they said, that the entrance to the town should no longer be annoyed by dragging criminals through the streets. After that, the execution took place at York Castle, uh, say, until 1896, that's when the last uh, one took place in there. So the bodies could either be reclaimed by the friends and family and taken back home, such as the case was with David Hartley, or, or as we see here, was put into a pauper grave. Of, this is the gravestone there of Richard Dick Turpin uh, that's in the former uh, chapel graveyard of St George, uh, fairly, uh, fairly close to Warmgate, where it still stands, a bit of a tourist attraction today, but said he was into a pauper graveyard there. Other ones, uh, people that were hung in the castle, were buried behind the female prison, which is now part of the castle museum, in the piece of sort of ground behind there and the river Foss. But, like I say, if you were buried, it might mean that uh, you might have been disinterred by sometimes what's called the body snatchers or the resurrection men. Uh, here we see two photographs in, in Yorkshire. This one here is called the Watch House at the Church of St Nicholas at Upper Bradfield, which is about sort of uh, 10 miles from the centre of Sheffield into the sort of Peak District. And the other is the grave of uh, Lauren Stern at the Church of St Michael at Coxwold. This um, watch house was built in 1745. Uh, say as a property to guard against grave robbers. Uh, <clears throat> robbers. They were looking for corpses for medical studies. Uh, and that's why a lot of them uh, were dug up, as in the case as over here of Lawrence Stern. Uh, although he was the vicar of uh, Coxwold and still held that appointment, he was a very well-known uh, author and said that he uh, lived to be famous. And that's probably why he died in London of consumption uh, uh, in 1768 at the age of 54. His body was disinterred from the graveyard there and taken up to Cambridge University. And after it had been dissected and looked at, uh, was placed in another grave round there. But in 1969, the great churchyard in Cambridge was being redeveloped and the bones of Lawrence Stern were disinterred and because uh, they were then brought up and reinterred by the, at the expense of the Lawrence Stern Trust on the outside of the church at Coxwold. I found no evidence of uh, body snatching uh, at Upper um, Bradfield. Uh, and so obviously the building here did the job, but that's the only watch house that is left in Yorkshire. I guess uh, other cemeteries would have had uh, these uh, as well, but have all been demolished uh, since then. Uh, and so I've looked at other cases, but there's no real uh, evidence that body snatching 
actually occurred in Yorkshire. Uh, I, I think a lot of it was superstition and things like that, that some bodies have been taken, uh, but in Hull and other places like that, but never sort of substantiated in any way at all. So I talked uh, about the non-conformist uh, burials taking place uh, and being authorised really after the sort of Religious Toleration Act. But in fact, it actually occurred a lot earlier than that. They date really from 1646. This is really uh, as a result of the uh, Roundheads uh, winning the uh, Civil War and they were the, really the Puritans under Oliver Cromwell. And uh, I guess they were sort of flexing their power a bit uh, with the building of their sort of independent chapels. And they were really the first uh, interments that took place after that. And I think in the sort of a change of the kings and queens and things like that, uh, this sort of practice uh, fell out and you still had to be have your mortal remains buried in the Church of England church. But under Hardwick's Marriage Act of 1753, uh, which is slightly uh, unusual, um, because it declared that still at that time or reiterating that all burials had to play, take place at the Church of England parish church. Uh, but now baptisms and burials, uh, sorry, those weddings could take place in there, uh, but not at non-conformist chapels. But it reiterated that baptisms and burials uh, could now take place in the uh, non-denominational churches, such as uh, we have up here, the oldest uh, um, Methodist chapel in continuous use. Again, the octagonal chapel up here at uh, Hepton Store that we see here. But there were all slightly different sort of uh, uh, alterations in how burials took place. Let's uh, look at the Quakers, uh, for instance. This is up at High Flats, up at Denbidale in the Upper Dern Valley. Uh, and uh, say in, during the 18th and 19th centuries is that uh, Quakers insisted on simple burials uh, with no ornate monuments. You can see here in the in the graveyard here is that they're all of the same size and things like that. And they got very simple inscriptions on them as well. Sometimes it's just their initials and the year that they died. I guess there's records with inside the uh, Quaker meeting houses themselves, uh, which might tell you a little bit more about the person. Uh, but I say these are actually quite large ones. If you go into some of the other ones, sometimes they've been uh, removed, uh, the, um, the memorials, uh, largely because they want to mow the grass in front of the meeting houses. So if you go to one at Rawdon or the one down in, in the middle of Skipton, you'll see that they're actually much smaller uh, than this. So are really about a quarter of the size. And another different uh, religious sect were the uh, Moravians who moved into uh, bought land at Full Neck, just outside Pudsey, Leeds in 1751. They've been uh, founded in Bohemia, now part of the Czech Republic in 1547, by the followers of John Hus, uh, who was burned to death for his beliefs in 1415. One of those beliefs was that the uh, services should be held in the mother tongue, because at that time, all services, uh, uh, Roman Catholic services, as, as it were, were all held in Latin. That's why there's sometimes murals put on the walls of churches, such as in Pickering and other places, to retell those Bible stories. Because I guess, you know, as a uh, a, a probably a normal townsperson, you wouldn't have a clue what was going on in the service because you didn't understand really what was going on. But the Moravians came over here when they met uh, a, a Methodist preacher from Osset called Benjamin Ingham. And that's how they come to, came to buy this land on the outskirts of Pudsey. But they had a slightly different uh, uh, attitude towards death, as we'll see on this bit of film. On the lane stands God's Acre, the burial ground. At one time it was split one side for the brethren and the other for sisters. Moravians are taught not to fear death and at Easter used to hold a vigil that ended when a horn was blown at daybreak. Today a service accompanied by the Gawthorpe Brass Band is held at 7am. The settlement was highly organised it was run by a conference of elders. They decided the rules and regulations, as well as the allocation of jobs. Let's move on to something uh, slightly different here and look at the, a couple of people who have uh, unusual graves. Uh, let's move down to Market Wheaton. This is uh, 
at the grave of William Bradley, who was a giant of a man. He was born in 1797 and uh, was the 13th child of the local butcher. His, uh, the, his statue stands at the uh, gateway into um, Market Wheaton. So let's look on to some more unusual graves that we can find around Yorkshire. The first thing we're going to look at is for a giant of a man, William Bradley, uh, who was born in Market Wheaton. His statue, as you can see here, stands at the entrance to the town if you're coming from the Pockrington end or at the far end of the town if you're coming through Market Wheaton himself, itself. He was born in 1787 and was the 13th child of the local butcher. Uh, you feel sorry for his uh, wife, uh, even when he was born, probably even more sorry when he learned that he was uh, weighed a stone when he was born. And when he died at the age of 33 on the 30th of May 1820, he weighed 27 stone. He probably wasn't enormously big, uh, fat in the, for, for his weight, but largely because of his, uh, his uh, height. He was seven foot nine inches high, and his legs are said to have been four foot high. I could say that uh, his waist would have come up to the height of, uh, I could say, uh, people age, you know about five foot five uh, tall, so everybody would have looked up to him. Uh, and he was so unusual that he became part of Barnum's uh, traveling circus around the country. And he was even uh, introduced to uh, King George III, who presented him with a gold chain. Uh, the memorial is in the church itself. And this is slightly unusual, I ought to take a, a wider view of it. But the height of the shelf here from where you're standing looking up is to the height of the top of the head of William Bradley. Basically, it says in there that he, he died age uh, 33 and his height and things like that. So we've met the oldest man in Yorkshire and the tallest man in Yorkshire. In fact, we might both hold national records. So let's have a look at another ornate and very unusual tomb as well. This is Sir John Hovham at South Dalton. Uh, South Dalton's really the centre of the Wolds almost. Uh, it's well known for the, its uh, gastronomy at the Pipe and Glass Inn uh, there. Uh, the Hovham family still have a hall and remarkably a public road uh, goes through that hall. But the church here of St Mary is probably most renowned for its spire and it can be seen from most of the uh, walls uh, uh, around there. And because inside the church are a number of sort of uh, graves and plaques to the Hovham family. Uh, they were moved here from an earlier church that stood just nor uh, north of it because the church that you go in today is largely uh, a Victorian uh, church. The other one, because they stood really next door to it uh, in, in, in a field uh, next to it. Uh, what's unusual uh, about this one, it's uh, of Sir John Hovham, the second baronet who died in 1680. 89. Here he is posing on top uh, of the, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, well, he's held aloft uh, by uh, four, uh, I guess, angels or cherubs or, or, or something like that. He's reclining on there, propping himself up with his arm and uh, with uh, his, uh, his, his knight gauntlets uh, next to him. And uh, say, uh, underneath, which his body is there, he is there represented in death as a skeleton. So as a human form as he was, and then uh, what he will be like after that underneath. Uh, quite a, a gruesome thing as well. And in many of these sort of uh, churches built uh, or medieval churches uh, around at this time, you see these hatchments on the walls uh, and it's a corruption of the word attachment uh, and these became popular in the 17th century uh, and were always lozenge shaped and include the coats of arms of the person uh, who had died uh, though usually uh, initially placed over the entrance door of the uh, person who's died's house so it's you know you go underneath the main door into it uh, and then afterwards uh, uh, after that the good idea is that uh, they would uh, 
well, when they put them on the above the door, they'd be up there for a period of a six or 12 months. And then that board would be taken into the church and put on display. And then, I guess, probably 10 or 20 years later, somebody brought thought it was a good idea is that these hatchments would be carried in front of the coffin and then would be left in the church immediately straight away after that. This one is uh, from St Mary up in Thirsk. Uh, a lot of these uh, are to do uh, with the Bell family, and that's why you see in the middle hatchment here the three bells of that family. Uh, a lot of the church have these on, on display uh, still. One of the best places to go to to sort of look at sort of a, a cemetery or, or a graveyard, as you have it, is... I don't know why it does that, it's a bit annoying, uh, is uh, to go to Hepton Stall uh, up above Hebden Bridge, a mile straight up there on the Calder Valley. And uh, like I say, we had a, another change in the sort of law at this time, uh, 100 years after really the sort of the, uh, uh, the, the Wool Act and things like that, in the, there's a Stamp Act of 1783, uh, and that uh, it uh, really was raising money for the crown, is that basically uh, threepence had to be put on every uh, register uh, of burials, uh, marriage and christenings as well, and uh, that the uh, minister would be allowed uh, would have to collect that tax, uh, but will be allowed 10% of it for his trouble. And uh, say this then was first introduced into the Church of England and then covered all non-conformists as, as well. And uh, say up to um, the sort of the, um, the 16th, middle of the 16th century, uh, is that uh, I think people uh, recognise is that if you uh, buried in a, in, in a cemetery uh, next to a church is that uh, sometime in the future is that it was largely seen as a temporary affair is that uh, your uh, body uh, will be exhumed or the uh, grave would be uh, 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 take, taken away and reused at that time. And uh, so this is what we see happening up in the uh, churchyard at Hepton Stall is this building here, which abuts uh, the, uh, the churchyard. And this is called the charnel house, uh, which basically means that when they came to reuse a grave, any bones found in there, there would be taken into the charnel house. I don't know what people think about that today because that charnel house is now part of that house attached to it. But a lot of graveyards had these charnel houses uh, uh, to, to do that, largely because there were so many uh, burials uh, around here. Uh, I think they've estimated that there's something like 100,000 burials had taken place in Hepton Stall. One of the uh, more unusual graves is this one over here to uh, David Hudson. Uh, and one other thing to look at the Calder Valley graves is that they are, tend to be more ornate uh, than other people's graves. Uh, and we see here there's the use of a sort of love heart uh, in there and other devices uh, in, uh, in the do it. And because it, uh, it doesn't stretch, I guess, for about a 25 mile radius around the sort of the Calder Valley, uh, because it has influenced the uh, people who have designed uh, the grave covers in, in this way. So if you look around this graveyard, you see lots of them are like this. This is dated 1763. Uh, and I think there's one in Horse of here as well, which has got this type of device on it, uh, which is dated, I think, about 1670 as well. So it was sort of uh, in, uh, in that sort of uh, way. But the one in Horse of Graveyard on the green in the Bell Chapel is the only one uh, which is decorated in that style. But come up here to Hepton Saw and lots of them are decorated in that style. This grave here is to uh, David Hartley. Uh, and uh, he was one of the uh, Crag Valley coin clippers. Uh, they were people who, uh, when uh, money was in gold at that time, uh, took off the edge of, of, of a coin and uh, around about 15% of the gold uh, and then remilled the edge uh, and then put that coin back into circulation. And with the excess gold, well, I guess they could make other coins or into jewellery or whatever it was. And uh, so they uh, was uh, putting this back into circulation 
and the Customs and Excise uh, um, Inspector from Halifax, Sir William Deaton, was sent to discover where this was happening. Uh, Deaton uh, was killed when he was approaching Hartley's house, which was up at Erringdon, uh, which is part of the uh, Crag Vale. And, uh, um, and, but uh, others gave up his name uh, when they were tortured uh, to give up Hartley's name. Uh, he was taken across to York because in those days uh, that was the only place that uh, a crime of this nature could be heard was in the assize at York. And we say it was, uh, that continued really right through to near enough today has been York, the main assize court uh, for being the capital of, of Yorkshire. And that was taken on there. Uh, and we'll come and look at the executions in the uh, next slide because he was hanged at York on the 28th of April 1770 and his body was brought back here and buried here as well which is uh, not unusual when we come to look at the executions here um the uh, the first one took uh, place here back on the Naysmire on the 31st of March 1379 when Edward Hewison was executed for rape uh, and was uh, said to have been executed on the New Gallows at York Tyburn. Executions took place here and at three other sites in York uh, for the next 400 years. Execution day was always a big rowdy event uh, criminals because uh, they were a spectacle and that's what really brought the gentry into York uh, uh, during the season uh, and this is when they uh, coincided with the assize courts as well which were generally held uh, once once a quarter so they could actually see two of these and I guess that some of these cases might have been held over for the season so people who watched the trials and there was no really waiting around after a trial had ended and because the uh, in the next couple of days is that the person would be sent off to be executed uh, and uh, uh, it was quite a, a, a big event uh, everybody would get to know about it handbills were printed songs were composed uh, and uh, largely that they were held in York Castle until the, uh, on the morning of the execution and then uh, on most cases were taken on a hurdle, dragged through the streets uh, by a horse in front of that and generally taken down to the Knavesmire to be executed. And until 1745, the bodies were uh, hung, drawn and quartered down there as well. Uh, the, uh, the drawing and quartering taking place back in the castle. Uh, the last hanging took place uh, publicly in, on the Naysmire in 1801, after which he uh, took place at York Castle. Uh, this was in order, as I, I said, uh, that the entrance to the town should no longer be annoyed by dragging criminals through the streets. It wasn't just the criminals, but it was a huge crowd, which could sort of uh, go to 30,000 people. Uh, and so it really became a bit of a fair uh, and uh, lasting the rest of the day as well. Um, many uh, were, bodies were then claimed by the families and taken back uh, to the place of where they came. That's why uh, Richard uh, uh, Hartley, sorry, David Hartley's was taken back to Hepton Stall. Uh, others, uh, were, those not claimed, uh, were put in pauper sections of the graveyards. And that's why we see Dick Turpins here uh, in, in the graveyard uh, that stood farthest uh, from, from the church. Uh, it was an unmarked grave until uh, because it, this gravestone uh, was put up. Others uh, were put uh, behind uh, when they were executed at the castle. They were buried behind the castle. So I guess in the area, uh, I think it's behind the women's prison, uh, which is uh, between there and the River Foss. There's a, a bit of ground around there. But even if you had been buried in a graveyard, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't, your body shouldn't be snatched. Uh, so we're looking at uh, two pictures here. Uh, this is the watch house at Upper Bradfield. Uh, you can see the churchyard is behind that and the church is just off the photograph here. And this one is in Coxwell. This is to the author Lauren Stern, uh, whose uh, grave is placed on the outside of St Michael's Church there. So largely because the bodies were wanted uh, largely in uh, places where they were instructing uh, people, I guess, in uh, university type hospitals uh, to, for dissections and things like that, for medical 
practitioners uh, to see, uh, I guess, on disease and things like that. So people could give up their bodies freely uh, for medical uh, in inspections. I guess I think people still can today as well, uh, but there were not enough people were doing that in the uh, sort of 17th and 18th century. And therefore, uh, uh, resurrection is men were called or body snatchers uh, were called in to uh, get these uh, people out of graves which have recently been dug. So much so up in Upper Bradfield uh, which is about uh, 12 miles to the west of uh, Sheffield. It's really coming up onto the Derbyshire uh, border up there. They were so worried about this happening that they built this uh, 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 sort of irregularly shaped house, uh, which is uh, now used as a house, in 1745 to guard against grave robbers uh, and uh, could say that uh, they were sometimes uh, armed as well to stop these people uh, going into the graveyards as, as well. It's the only surviving watch house in Yorkshire. There are a number of uh, of uh, speculations of grave uh, robbing going on in Yorkshire, but none of them have actually been sort of uh, particularly uh, sort of substantiated anyway. Uh, I've looked at stories from Hull and, and Barnsley uh, that uh, reflect that uh, maybe young women and, and men had been taken, uh, but this has never been sort of confirmed. The only confirmed case that we do have uh, that actually didn't occur in Yorkshire, uh, but occurred down in London, is of Lawrence Stern. And because uh, he was the vicar up at Coxall, 1760, until his death on the 18th of March, 1768, at the age of 54. Because uh, he didn't die in Coxwold, uh, but he died in London of consumption. Uh, he always said, uh, I think one of his famous quotes was, he, uh, he wrote, to be famous uh, and they were, well, were going to take, make the most of, it, of his fame uh, and the fortune that he gathered uh, from that and probably that's why he was down in London enjoying himself. He was uh, uh, buried in the churchyard of St George's in Hanover Square but body snatchers took his uh, body uh, to the anatomist at Cambridge University and later was reinterred there. Uh, but in 1969, the churchyard was redeveloped uh, and the bones uh, of Lawrence Stern uh, were disinterred and uh, they were bought up here by the Lawrence Stern Trust and reinterred on the outside of the church here. So his actual uh, body, body parts and his uh, grave now stands back in Coxwold. So that was a sort of, uh, I wouldn't quite say tenuous connection with body snatching in Yorkshire uh, because he actually did live at, at Shandy Hall, uh, just an almost opposite the church there in Coxwold. Uh, and it's a good place, uh, obviously, both two stories there is that you can actually have tours uh, around Newborough Priory and, and they do take you up into the attic to show you Oliver Cromwell's uh, tomb, although the lady sternly told everybody there's no photographs to be taken. Uh, so I sneakily took those ones which you've seen of, of that. And also Shandy Hall is also open as well. You can have tours of that uh, with the current custodian of, of that. And the church is just across the road, uh, quite an interesting church as well in there. So I said uh, that with that sort of uh, religious toleration act is that the chapels could now be built and they were tend to be built with uh, churchyards uh, uh, around them. So the nonconformist records had to go back prior to that. They go back to 1646. This was largely a result of the Puritans under Cromwell seizing power. And uh, it came quite a, a, um, a confusing time within the religion of the company because these were sort of... Uh, Puritans and uh, other dissenting groups uh, like Baptists um, were seen as being part of the Church of England, but not part of them, if you, if, if you get my drift. And they were really flexing their power at that time. And uh, it wasn't really known whether they were allowed to have graveyards because they're all meant to be buried in Church of England graveyards uh, or not. And I think initially, really until 1660, a blind eye was taken to this until Charles II came onto the throne. That's why there's sometimes uh, burial records uh, for people going back to the end of the Civil War uh, for that 15-year period. Uh, 
But it seems, though, that uh, those, uh, there's a marriage act called Hardwick's Marriage Act of 1753 that said all those uh, English uh, marriages uh, really had to take place in a Church of England parish church. Um, that was the sort of marriages had to take place there, except those of Quakers and Jews. Uh, and that uh, baptisms and burials could now take place uh, within these chapels, uh, come back up to Hepnestor, that's is the oldest sort of uh, octagonal chapel in use, and therefore you can see, technically, uh, legally, is that these graves will date from 1753 afterwards. And they can see them all laid out here, and there's a newer graveyard extending further down there, so it is quite a, a, a large graveyard in its own. And it also differed, it meant that uh, burials taking place here would have to go into their own register books and not in the Church of England ones. So uh, it didn't seem though that some of these uh, nonconformist chapels kept them uh, as a bad pun here, religiously, as they did in the Church of England one, because the bishops could come in there to make sure that they were done properly. But I don't think bishops had jurisdiction, really, over these nonconformist chapels, so they weren't, uh, I guess, they kept as well. I guess it's down to the individual minister. And so we see that uh, some of these um, um, started to have their burials. Uh, we'll look at two of them here. This is the Quakers, uh, they tend to go for uh, a uniformity uh, of grave. They tend to be quite small. They're slightly larger here. This is about high flats uh, above Denby Dale, uh, which is still used as a Quaker meeting house today, although burials no longer take place in the graveyard. Quite a few of them have been uh, cleared. Uh, so if you go to the one at Rawdon, uh, closest uh, to here, and to some of the other ones, is that the, uh, the gravestones have been taken down and placed again against the wall, uh, as David told me, that's for ease of mowing the grass in front of them. They were also frowned upon, uh, they, they are simple as well. Sometimes they just have the initial on them and the date of death. So you don't, I guess people around the time knew who they were, uh, and then later on, it doesn't give you really any sense of social history in them. And because if these are slightly larger ones, some of these can be sort of a quarter of the size of these, uh, and sometimes laid flat as well in, in the ground. Uh, so obviously Quakers weren't as sort of uh, uh, mindful perhaps uh, of that uh, uh, as the Church of England do, where you could have really have a gravestone which told your life story on them. So we have the Quakers, we'll just look at uh, another uh, one of these uh, groups here, and that's the Moravians. Uh, they came in, in the, to Full Neck, uh, which is uh, outside of Pudsey of, of Leeds in 1751. They've been founded in Bohemia, now part of the Czech Republic in 1457, by the followers of John Huss. He was burnt to death as a heretic in 1415 uh, for his beliefs. Uh, these beliefs were that uh, of a simple life, community, and probably uh, the most outrageous of them, of preaching in the mother tongue. Because uh, at that time, really up to the time of the founding of the Church of England, all services were in Latin. So no one really had a clue uh, of what was going on in those. And I guess that's why they put murals on the side of the medieval churches to uh, people could look at those uh, stories on there. Like I say, they were persecuted for their beliefs and uh, moved around Europe until they were invited uh, to England uh, in the, by a chap called Benjamin Ingham, who came to know them, uh, and he was a preacher from Osset, and that's why they came up and bought the lands at Full Neck. Uh, what we have here is on a piece of film is that uh, it tells you the story, uh, but they uh, revere their dead and they really have no uh, fear of death. And we'll see here what happens uh, on the eve of, um, of Easter. On the lane stands God's Acre, the burial ground. At one time it was split one side for the brethren and the other for sisters. Moravians are taught not to fear death and at Easter used to hold a vigil that ended when a horn was blown at daybreak. Today, a service, accompanied by the Gawthorpe Brass Band, is held at 7am. 
the settlement was highly organized. It was run by a conference of elders. They decided the rules and regulations, as well as the allocation of jobs. So that's a, a slightly different sort of view on, on death there as, as well. So let's move down to some more uh, strange graves. Uh, and this is to William Bradley. Uh, he was this very tall man uh, from Market Wheaton. And uh, uh, there's a statue to him, uh, which I pictured there, which is on the main road in from Pocklington into the town. Uh, although if you're coming in that way, you're facing his back. Uh, but uh, if you're coming through uh, Market Wheaton from the other direction, he's actually facing you. Uh, he was born here in 1787, uh, the 13th child of a local butcher. He weighed a stone, or 16 pounds, is that right, when he, when he was born. And uh, when he died, aged 33, on the 30th of May, 1820, he weighed uh, 27 stone. His first pictures have been quite similar, and he probably was, but it was his height. He was seven foot nine inches tall, and his legs are said to have been four feet long. So a veritable giant of a man. He uh, became so well known for his height uh, uh, is that he joined uh, Barnum's show, but travelled the country. And uh, you say he was seen by King George III, who gave him a gold um, coin uh, as well. So, uh, sorry, a gold chain on that. But if you go into the church, I ought to take a, a slightly wider picture of this. Uh, but if you go into the church, there's a memorial to him uh, high up on the wall. The ledge here is seven foot nine inches above where you're stood. So you've really got to stare up into the air. And it really is quite unbelievable how tall he was. Uh, and that's what the ledge represents. And then above there, William Bradley, son of John and, uh, and Bradley of Market Wheaton, who died May the 30th, 1820, aged 33 years ago, because they measured uh, say his height there, seven foot six, and weighing, weighing 27 stone as well. So he's the uh, tallest man uh, in, uh, in Yorkshire, and because they would have the oldest man as well. And we have another odd grave here, uh, called the Watery Grave up at Kirkby Malham, so upon Malhamdale, about uh, two or three miles uh, before you reach Malham at the head of the grave in the Church of St Michael and the Archangel uh, up there. And uh, the story goes, it's a, a bit sort of out of this uh, time, this is uh, dates from around about uh, 1900, uh, 1890, that uh, Colonel John Harrison, he died in 1900, but his wife predeceased him and she died in 1890. And uh, um, when they came to dig the grave, it actually uh, came uh, unearthed a spring. And uh, but the colonel decided is that uh, as they bought that plot, they would still continue uh, to use it and make a feature of it. And that uh, so his wife's buried one side. I don't know which side she's buried, and he's buried the other side of of that. Uh, and that's a very unusual grave. I uh, can see the spring water coming out there. It's uh, if you come into the church, uh, the car park is actually over this side. But if you come in from the village side through the Lich Gate, uh, which is further down here, the watery grave is in that area down there. So it's a, a bit away from where you would probably technically come in because you wouldn't park on the, the main road through there because it's so narrow. Uh, but like I said, the church car park is by the main door. So you need to really to come right to the east end of the church down there to see that. So that dates from 1890, but I've sort of skipped ahead slightly there. Uh, but then the gentry uh, decided that these are probably these local churches weren't good enough uh, for them. And they decided to build their own mausoleum. So we're seeing two here, the one at Castle Howard. And this one here is at uh, Holsom uh, uh, at, in, in East Yorkshire. And there's the Constable Mausoleum. Uh, the one at Castle Howard we'll look at first was designed by Nicholas Hawksmoor, who'd lived 1661 to 1736. Uh, he took over really uh, from the designing of uh, Sir John Vanbrugh, who designed 
uh, or drew uh, what Castle Howard uh, was to be like. Uh, but uh, Vanborough died in 1726. And uh, so um, the Charles Howard uh, had this built and uh, really is the first interment here was himself. Uh, it's 90 feet high and gonna say, supported by a, a circular colonnade of 20 pillars. Building began in 1729, but still wasn't fully completed uh, before the deaths of either uh, Charles Howard or uh, Hawksmoor as, as well. And because uh, they were originally buried in the local parish church and again uh, were then interred in the ma mausoleum when this was finished in 1732. And it's still a private burial place for the Howard family. And I guess they stand about a mile from the house. But it's one of those uh, things where it's sort of uh, more uh, in turn of, of a feature of, of the landscape that could be seen from the house and associated uh, with the house. And uh, whereas when we're coming across to look at the Constable uh, Mausoleum over at Holsham in East uh, Yorkshire, uh, this is completely different because uh, it was for the Constable family of Burton Constable, uh, which is 10 miles away from the north, so obviously can't be seen from the house uh, uh, at all. Uh, but the fact is, is that the Constable family held the manor of West Holsham and had done since the 12th century. And uh, you say they, that was part of the reason uh, why it was built over, over here. Uh, and it was really sort of the right, uh, because it was the, I guess, the ancient manor uh, of, of theirs. And uh, so they had a house here for 500 years before Burton Constable Hall uh, was built as well. That was started off in the uh, 1560s. So I guess this is really called that sort of ancestral home although they held estates uh, elsewhere, they held estates up at Flamborough as well. Uh, but uh, they, they bought this estate round here, 1329 to 1341 uh, uh, as, as well. And it reputedly uh, stands on the site of a uh, an Iron Age or earlier uh, tumulus. Uh, so we uh, obviously when it was built, uh, that was completely uh, destroyed. Uh, but again, it's similar in style if you look at the central aspect of the Castle Howard mausoleum, uh, but this is slightly different, uh, well, not that much different, but again, you can see here is the entrance to the vault, uh, which is underneath it. And again, exactly the same thing here is this is raised up a floor. And if you go through the main door, it's not open. Uh, and I guess it's a, maybe perhaps on application or something like that, is then uh, there's a staircase which takes you down to the vault uh, on the inside of that as well. And uh, say the, uh, that's really what we're looking at. It was designed by Thomas Atkinson, quite a, a famous uh, architect uh, of the day. So we, that's my link to the next one, actually, is that the great architect of the day was John Carr, who was born at Horbury. Uh, and really what he uh, built for himself wasn't a mausoleum, but a, really, a, I guess, a church in his memory, although he might have disputed that. But it's one of the finest Jordan churches and towers over the sort of uh, uh, the village of Horbury, which is actually quite smart. It sort of uh, lies in the Wakefield district just off the M1 uh, further down there. Uh, and because uh, he built this uh, in uh, what's well, completed in 1794. The reason for it is that he was born in Horbury in 1723 uh, and uh, uh, worked uh, as an architect in York over many fine buildings and, and bridges and such like and bought the manor off the Peeble family in 1799. Like you see before that, he built the, the church here on some land that he brought. He also bought the manor of Askham Richard and died there on the 22nd of February 1807. But he was brought down here and the vault for the Carr family run, runs under this uh, side chapel as well because it cost him a fair amount of money, but he made a lot of money. It cost him £8,000 to build in 1794, which is valued at around about a million pounds uh, today. So uh, it largely became really a, a mausoleum in, in a way for the church that he built for himself.
So that's an architect. Let's look at an industrialist uh, who we've looked at a, a, a week or so ago, Matthew Murray. He was a man, uh, uh, I think, was born up in Durham and came down to, uh, tempted down to Leeds, I, I think, really, uh, in order to sort of work in engineering works around here, uh, largely to fix uh, uh, textile machinery uh, to begin with. Uh, so he was... Uh, came down here and he was a man responsible for the very first uh, steam engines uh, that pulled coal on the uh, line uh, that he built uh, from Middleton Pits up to the uh, River Eyre by Leeds Bridge uh, in order uh, to move coal around a lot more quickly. Pictured on this bench here in front of it is the uh, first steam engine that he built called the Salamanca uh, and his grave is behind there. He died in Leeds on the 20th of February 1826 at the age of 60. Um, he lived down near where the temple works are further down there uh, because I, I guess he was an industrialist at heart, lived in the heart of the industrial uh, Leeds at Hol in Holbeck and was said to be the first man to have central heating in his house. So we're very much an engineer and designer. And in fact, he got this rather unusual uh, pinnacle here, and that's completely made of cast iron. A most unusual type of uh, one there, and because they, he's uh, bur buried in a vault below there, alongside his uh, children uh, as well. Because that Salamanca first pulling the coal in 1812. So let's have a look at some of the, uh, just going back, just mention that. This is in the Holbeck uh, Cemetery, uh, which has largely been raised and flattened now, uh, just leaving that. So it's, uh, you see rather here, it's a, bit, a bit of a grim place. The church, it stands behind me. One of the older cemeteries stands above uh, there uh, 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 as well uh, at, uh, at uh, Hunslet uh, on, on top of the hill. In fact, the parishes uh, run down the middle of, of the graveyard uh, itself. So coming to one of those ones which were built in, the, in, in this sort of period, uh, this is the first public graveyard to be built in uh, in Leeds. Uh, and this is in the uh, called St George's Fields, uh, which is in now behind the School of Engineering uh, or the Parkinson Building. It's in an enclosed piece of land around there. And to say that I've wandered around the university numerous times, uh, I never knew it was there until a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see there's a, a hall of residence running behind uh, along there. That's behind here is one of the roads that leads into the main university precinct. The Parkinson building and the School of Engineering are directly behind me. So it's completely enclosed around there. And uh, this was a public cemetery uh, built privately by the Leeds General Cemetery Company. Cost £11,000. I guess most of that was spent on this sort of central uh, chapel here uh, uh, as well. And it's unconsecrated uh, and was largely intended for use by dissenters. And um, the chapel has a blue plaque on the side down there. Uh, that's to the uh, uh, painter John Atkinson Grimshaw. Uh, his grave, uh, unfortunately, has been removed and nobody knows where it was. Like you say, uh, if you look around here uh, for ease of mowing and things like that, there are groups of graves around here. There's some in the trees over there. There's one to Edward Baines, uh, one of the newspaper proprietors of, of Leeds. And then there is a path of graves. Uh, so it gives you an impression of what it's like. Behind me, there's a, a, a number of graves in a copse of trees. But the ones to look out for is by the temple here and there's three of them and uh, I've shown you one, uh, one of them before uh, I think it's this one here that's to Anne Carr uh, she was a, uh, a dissenting minister and, and it's unusual because it was a female doing that job when I could say the sort of the whole of the clergy uh, was male dominated at that time so that's a uh, one to look for the other one here is that uh, I was told about uh, by one of our uh, members uh, that I knew nothing about uh, was this one to Pablo Fank, uh, and because uh, he became uh, f very famous uh, worldwide uh, because of its connection with the Beatles. Uh, and uh, uh, Pablo Fank was the stage name of the circus owner, uh, circus owner William Darby. 
And that's what confused me when I first came into the graveyard to look at this uh, about three weeks ago, is that uh, I'd seen a photograph of it, uh, but you got to look at the top for Susanna Derby. Below, further down there, is uh, Pablo Fanks uh, or William Derby's name. Um, how it came connected with the Beatles is that John Lennon bought a Victorian circus poster, and it being circa 1842 to 1845 of a circus that was held in Rochdale, and uh, uh, and Pablo Fanks' name is on that, and John Lennon lifted really the whole of that poster uh, for the lyrics for the uh, being for the benefit of Mr Kite, uh, which is on their Sergeant. Pepper album. Uh, I'm not singing this, but the lyrics go, for the benefit of Mr. Kite, there'll be a show tonight on trampoline. The Hendersons will all be there late of Pablo Fanks's fair. What a scene. Uh, so Mr. Kite worked for Pablo Fanks uh, between 1843 to 45. The Hendersons were John and his wife, uh, Agnes, who were tightrope uh, wire walkers. Because uh, on here, it's got the top of the grave to his wife, Susanna. She died aged 47 as a result of a part of the tent, uh, the circus tent, falling on her during an evening performance uh, when a beam gave way of the uh, holding the structure up. And she was in the box office and it collapsed on top of her. This is Saturday, uh, 18th of March, 1847. She was the only fatality. The tent uh, raised was on King Charles's Croft, uh, which is uh, on Lands Lane, uh, uh, in between Lands Lane and I think it's also uh, uh, King Charles's Croft, the other side still, uh, where the core is. So between Lands Lane and the back alley of, of the core um, uh, down there. So that's where it stood. Uh, Pablo Fank himself died in 1871 and instructed that wherever he's died, his body would be returned to lead, Leeds and buried in the same grave as his wife. So that's the uh, relation between uh, Pablo Fank and uh, the Beatles and Leeds, uh, most unusual. I must thank uh, Janet uh, for informing me of that story. I've not seen it uh, before anywhere else. So we see that's the first uh, sort of general uh, graveyard in Leeds. Uh, another one uh, slightly different from, from in design from this. This was more of a, a classical design. And we see that most of these you had to be paid. Uh, you had to pay to be interred in here. So there wouldn't be any pauper's graves or anything like that in here. They'd be buried uh, for normally for free in the local churchyard. So I guess this was seen that it was outside of Leeds city centre. It was next to Woodhouse Moor. And you'll be, I guess, interred with people of the same status who would have, uh, and the, the standing uh, tombs here, uh, are, I guess there are many of them. They're all of the larger style uh, variety. Uh, I guess that's probably one of the smaller ones that still stands. But I guess there were some fairly plain ones as well, but they've all gone apart from maybe just leaving these larger ones. The York General Cemetery, uh, that's on um, Barbican Road. Uh, if you uh, if you um, if you come up, let's say if you came up Fulford Road, uh, you can go straight forwards uh, on to uh, Fishergate, uh, or at a junction you can turn right onto Barbican Road. They both end up uh, by the side of a wall, but if you go up Bar uh, Barbican Road, it comes out roughly uh, in between. Uh, Warmgate Bar and where the Barbican Theatre is. So that's where York General Cemetery is, uh, say another early one. This was built in 1837, so two years after the opening of the Leeds General Cemetery. And this was designed to be less formal uh, and was designed as a garden cemetery. That's why we've got this sort of, uh, uh, sort of more grass and tree type thing. Again, similar to Leeds, uh, but the eye line going down to the um, to the chapel or Greek revival temple in the middle of it. It was designed by a local uh, band, James Pickett Pritchard. And uh, you'll say this was sort of a, become sort of the norm for the cemeteries that were built privately around this time. Uh, there were lush green uh, spaces uh, and didn't have a formal church in the middle of them. They had, like I say, these chapels uh, where services be held, but didn't look uh, particularly like a church. Notable monuments in here uh, are to the uh, Chocolate family, the Terry family, who are interred here. But 
let's have a look going back a few hundred years when I pointed out is that the uh, in the connection with York at Jewbury uh, until the Jews were expelled in 1275. They have a graveyard there. Uh, they were invited back by Oliver Cromwell in 1656 into England, but I guess it was a bit of a tenuous uh, use. And uh, we don't really see them coming back until, I guess, the 18th. Oops. Come on, go back. The Jews coming back again, uh, I guess, when, when they felt safer uh, to come here. Uh, and But it was, it was a long time before they built their first cemetery again. So I guess they were interred in Church of England uh, graveyards at, uh, until this time. Um, so this was uh, 1842 was the Leeds Jewish Cemetery uh, uh, was built. Um, the first sort of uh, synagogues have been built uh, in back in London uh, in 1842. And there was a, a, a Jewish re, uh, Jews Relief Act of 1858, which then granted uh, full political rights uh, for voting rights as well. And Lionel de Rothschild became the first Jewish MP uh, in that year, but they were allowed to vote. So it was really in a period uh, of when they probably were more generally settled. And then again, in the same period that Roman Catholics, I think the act came through 1825 or 1828, that they were allowed to build their own churches, really the first time since the uh, dissolution as well. So we see here Gabriel Davis, who leads Great Synagogue's first president, uh, gaining a uh, buying some land from the Earl of Cardigan in 1837. Uh, this lies off Gelded Road at Gildersum. Uh, so the furthest flung part of it when the, I think it's the 862 that goes over uh, towards Huddersfield. Uh, so it's built off uh, off that side. The uh, M621, uh, I think I think if it's still called that, runs on this side of it, just coming up here. You just can't see it on this photograph, but you can hear it. And the junction behind, I think, is where Ikea is. So it's on the sort of uh, pudsy side of the uh, uh, of the M621 there. I could say part of uh, uh, Gel Gelded Road. And I could say this was the first Jewish cemetery uh, to open in Leeds in 1840. Uh, I think it might have been the only one in Yorkshire. It's quite hard to determine, but I found out uh, another one uh, was built in Bradford lot because this was filling up fairly quickly uh, and they bought an, uh, another piece of land in 1880 uh, which is split from the main cemetery by another field and so there's the extension is a field beyond there so I guess there's a, perhaps a, a feeling that they'll probably buy the land in between although the person probably uh, holding out for a lot of money in order to join those up and uh, say we see a, a, a Jewish cemetery opening in Bradford and that uh, um, um, and that uh, the Jews who were in uh, York, the York Synagogue, uh, would be buried in Bradford. Uh, so I don't know what the arrangements are today and I haven't been really able to find out, uh, apart from there being a Jewish graveyard in Bradford somewhere. And But like I said, I knew where this was in Leeds and it's fairly easy uh, to, to, to get at. So I'll finish in, in, in a minute. Uh, um, because I couldn't finish it all in, 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 in a second day. Uh, coming up to a, another graveyard looking uh, in, in Leeds again. Um, this is the Beckett Street Cemetery uh, and it's opposite the main entrance to St James's Hospital and the Thackeray Medical Museum. It's in the Bermontoffs area of Leeds and that's what it was originally called when it opened in 1845 uh, and over the next 150 years interments took place 180,000 people were buried here in some 28,000 graves because say the uh, it was a this one was uh, one of the first publicly uh, funded cemeteries so it wasn't a private one it was funded by Leeds Corporation and it was uh, laid out at the same time as Hunslet Cemetery that's the one that lies above Holbeck Cemetery which I said was uh, being built as well. This was built on a grid and in rows so it is fairly easy to navigate around it obviously with graveyards there's lots of interest but I'm just going to point out uh, this one row here it's called the uh, Guinea Row and uh, this is sort of really runs along the crest of the hill of, of the graveyard. Uh, 
you can park uh, around it. Uh, there's really only one entrance, and that's the entrance opposite the Thackeray Medical Museum into it, because uh, there are plans in there. Uh, you can park on the roads around it if you're lucky. I went down here uh, the, the other day, and you can park for uh, up to an hour on side streets and main roads around there. But I guess uh, it'd be a pretty officious uh, with uh, parking attendants uh, around there. And uh, like I say, uh, you could easily fit a visit in within a, an hour for around there. But uh, largely people come to look at Guinea Row. There's other ones called American Row and, and other things like that associated uh, with different people uh, uh, as well. And this was the sort of part of the psyche of the Victorians at this time. And, and, and the Georgians as well, I suspect, is that it was important to uh, be able to have a funeral and to pay for the for the plot, uh, because I guess is that you didn't want to be thrown into the uh, the pauper's area of the graveyard. I think that was an anathema uh, to, to these people. There is a pauper's area to this, but you don't get a tombstone and they just guess that it, it, it's probably a, a wilderness type of area and that your body is placed in there. And so the poor, I guess through burial societies and things like that, which they pay for uh, through their work, uh, and they quite often met in pubs and you pay a small amount per week. And when you died, they would pay out uh, for for your burial as part of that. And so this one uh, of, of these people named along here, and there's probably 50 or 60 of these upright gravestones running al along Guinea Row, is that these are the people who saved up a guinea to be buried. Uh, say to be buried would be cost a lot more than that. And that's why you don't really have much choice. You get a burial plot, your name will be put on the gravestone, but you'll be interred with lots of other people, uh, but who'd also paid a guinea. So I guess it might be quite financially beneficial to have lots and lots of people, but it probably meant is that these graves would have to be dug enormously deep uh, in order to accommodate all those people. I think uh, a private gravestone would accommodate probably up to six people in there, which probably been digging down some like 20 feet in order to get that. But I think that was part of the first person who built, bought the plot is how many people but it would accommodate within it. So if you look at some of these graves, none of these people are related to one another. And that was the thing about it. You didn't really have much choice. So we see here on the ne nearest one here, uh, John Morgan, he died uh, 1831, age 50. Uh, Louisa Rushworth underneath him, 39. John Hall, 55. Isabella Atkinson, 54. But most of them, when you look at them, is that they tend to have lots of young children in them. So here we come down to them. Here we've got Nellie Cliff, she was 10. Arthur Weir, he was three. Mary Alderson, 15 months. Hannah Wales, three years. Sarah Haig, 15 months. Nellie Barnforth, eight months. And the first being interred here was actually George Longbottom, uh, probably, probably that apt, uh, and he was aged 23 years. In fact, uh, I've probably got that wrong way around because they probably put the first interment right at the top and then the last interment right at the bottom. Uh, so the sculptor could uh, add that in. So I've probably done it in, in, in reverse order. Uh, probably from the date as well, 1891, overall 1891. Uh, so we're really, I guess, one after the other uh, during, during that year. And all those graves along there are all the same uh, like that. So people had uh, saved up a small sum of money. I'll just finish on this last one because as we're on to early death and things like that, uh, and these are the cholera graveyards. Uh, these are because they came about uh, due to uh, drinking infected water, uh, normally infected water from human waste, um, from wells that people used to go and get uh, water from before main sewage uh, was really put down in the 1860s, really as the public health acts. And I'll be looking at that uh, at the beginning of that uh, next time uh, that were laid down between 1852 and 1857, uh, that led to the building of the reservoirs uh, of clean water, uh, the building of cemeteries, public building cemeteries and other things like that. Uh, and so the cholera graveyards, I was say, was the 
really was the effect of all sorts of waste going into the wells. And uh, no one knew what it was quite, uh, like for quite a long time uh, until the 1850s, when I think in London, they started to plot uh, where these people had died and then suddenly found out is that all these people were getting their water from the same wells. And quite often became infected, not particularly in dry periods, because I guess the stench of them will put people off and they go to another well nearby, but in very wet weather when it would wash the streets down and all the water, because they had nowhere else to go uh, but into the ground or into the well. And that was really when it sort of uh, took hold. So we see here two cholera graveyards, the one in Sheffield with this huge monument uh, uh, up there. Uh, that's a, a memorial to the epidemic of uh, 1832. Uh, 402 people died in that. Of those 402 people, 339 were interred here in front of the Park Hill Flats. Uh, that stands on the hill, but basically overlooks the city centre. Just near enough below me is the York, uh, not York, is the Sheffield Railway Station. Again, it was public health that led them to being built outside of the city centre because that was the fear is that the bodies would uh, obviously contaminate the graveyards and water the, uh, would go into the water as well. So they're always buried outside of it. And as we see here in York as well, this is uh, from a uh, epidemic uh, in 1832 as well, is that this graveyard was outside the wall of, of York. So it was really before it extended in Victorian times with the building, I uh, could see it over here, of the railway station. And even that first railway station hadn't been built. I think the line was pushed through the walls in uh, 1836 or, some, or something like that. So it really did stand outside uh, of York there. And this was in uh, a ditch as well at that time uh, that uh, was part of the defences of York. And that's why we've got this green space running all the way down from the railway station into there because that was the infilling of the ditch. Obviously, somebody uh, quite important uh, was buried here as well because they got a, a tomb there as well. But most of them, I guess, they were probably put into some sort of pit apart from those who could raise the money for their loved ones to be done on that. And it's normally because of these epidemics uh, coming along so quickly is that too many people died uh, at, at the same time in such a short space is that the local graveyards couldn't cope with that. And they say part of that was the, uh, uh, the public health as well, meaning they had to be built buried outside of the city centres. So I'll draw, draw to a close there.